This is a Say Sahan Dynamite Productions. Huh! 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 Warning, parental advisory is recommended. Oh, f- just listen. Hello, everyone in this big, vast universe. Thank you for downloading and listening. Follow, rate, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever else. And please don't forget to share. Also, you can get all of our latest links and episodes on DabashiRadioTakedownNetwork.com. You can dress in style and at the same time, Help keep the show free for you all by buying some of our swag at ButcherSpit.com. This is Volume 7 of Lyrical Spit, and I'm broadcasting live in my compound in Tacoma, Washington. I am not a sports entertainer. I am a professional wrestler that loves to entertain. I am the beast from the Middle East, the Yemeni maniac, the modern-day shit, they full of. The Butcher Debashi. And yes, I am ordained, and I can marry you and give you all your blessing needs. You can book me at debashibookings at gmail.com. Send your lyrical spit emails at lyricalspit at gmail.com. You can even leave a voice message on the 24 hour lyrical spit hotline. The number is 360 360- Two hundred eight seven seven nine, and your message might be played on the show. And be sure to check out the only brick and mortar professional wrestling museum and hall of fame solely for professional wrestling in Wichita Falls, Texas. You could check them out at www.pwhf.org. Tell Cowboy Johnny Mantel Debashi sent you. Also, check this podcast out. It's by a childhood friend of mine, Mel O. She has a book that just came out, named same as the podcast. It's titled Finances, the Other F Word. And she makes it sassy. And you know what? If you don't believe me, go check her podcast out on all major platforms. And another thing, we have a very special guest stopping by. Malaya Osaka, the modern day moolah. You've got mail. I want to start up the show with an email from Jesus Walker. He sent it to lyricalspit at gmail.com. It reads, Dobashi, knowing that you are a professional wrestler and with a lot of respect for the business, would you please do a 10-bell salute in remembrance of former WWE superstar and one half of the tag team crime time, Shad Gaspard? See, when the lifeguard came towards Shad to save him, he yelled to the lifeguard, save my son first. After they saved his son, Shad was submerged by a wave, never to reappear. If that's not going out like a hero, then I don't know what is. His literal last words were, save my son first. Yes, Jesus. My prayers go out to him, his family, friends and fans. Being a single father myself, it would be an honor for me to honor him. Let's take a moment of silence to honor Shad Gaspar.
Yo, 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 Chad Gaspard and JTG, it's crime time. Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Help us keep this show free for you all. It's easy to do. All you have to do is buy some of our swag at ButcherSpit.com. You can get my official They Full Up, the Butcher Debashi t-shirts and apparel. We also have our podcast apparel, Jibba Jabba, Lyrical Spit, and Conspiracy Talk, from t-shirts, hoodies, and even baby onesies. See, this year, the NCAA March Madness College Basketball Tournament may have been canceled, the I Survived March Madness 2020 t-shirts will be on sale for a limited time only. Butcherspit.com B-U-T-C-H-E-R-S-P-I-T.com I just want to thank each and every one of you who showed love to Lyrical Spit, my new baby. Mixing music from up and coming and unsigned artists with pro wrestling, interviews with other stuff to make this a soup of love. Malaya Osaka will be here soon, but first, this group, Dirty Tribe. From right here in the Pacific Northwest, you can subscribe to them on YouTube, and you won't be sorry. This is the Dirty Tribe, comes and goes. This is, this, is, this is Filipino reporter reporting from Lakewood, Washington, and it's the week two of the coronavirus. And uh, as you can see, we're not dead yet. <laughs> we're still here. We're still playing our music. Uh, this is the band uh, Dirty Tribe. And uh, this is a song called uh, Comes and Goes. Dirty 
That's the way life flows Live it as it comes and The G's were the stars, old English belt buckle with the cloth belt. Oh. Josh had that long hair, it hung so far, it took a couple extra seconds just to get in this. Knock my tooth out, put it up under my pillow, pack me up for lunch bowl, please throw in the jello. Get no kids in public school, playing rented jellos. Shout out to the Grand Riders, y'all wear the halos. Running around in play shoes, use a book for Kano, Eddie Francis. They were my heroes. Love for the craft, and though I ain't have the narrow mom, I used to give her blood marrow to buy me what I cared for. Video blazing, she was cooking up in her sandals. Grandpa passed away, we lit the candle upon the mantle. Trying to understand the tragedy I couldn't handle. Bobbing and weaving through all the economic shambles. Wash your hands, bitches. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One of the matches and that's no good. Yeah. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about three thousand. Ah. Nothing very nice. On a homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire, yeah. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire! I have a special announcement. This announcement is to a good friend of mine, Melissa Woodruff of Double D Photographies. Hey, Melissa, it was a rib. <laughs> oh, I know you're probably fuming now. I love you, girl. Everyone loves a good rib. You know what? I will explain to everyone next week. I will be right back with the modern-day moolah, Malia Osaka, right after Deborah Boston, the billion-dollar showgirl. You can check her out on SoundCloud. This is Deborah Boston to be low.
For all my Hulkamaniacs that have stuck with me through the thick and thin, train, said their prayers, and eat their vitamins, be a survivor, man. Don't smoke, it's a joke. The moment we all been waiting for. I would like to welcome my guest, the modern day mula, Malaya Osaka. How are you doing? It's an honor to have you on. I'm doing great. It's an honor to be on. I mean, I've heard that so many people have been on your show. It's been amazing. So I'm I'm privileged to be a part of them. Well, thank you. Thank you. And by the way, I just want to say I love your Facebook posts. They they make me crack up. I'll be dr- like Good. sitting there and I'll crack up out of the blue and people are looking at me like I'm crazy. And is it, this pretty fun? Good. But- that's, my, that's my goal because there's too much crap on Facebook. There's too much drama and too many opinions on uneducated opinions. So right. I don't want to get into all that. I just, I just really want to have fun. And, you know, I use Facebook to kind of promote things for promoters when I'm doing stuff with them and everything like that. But other than that, I just want you to laugh. If you go to my page, I just want you to be able to laugh and smile. That, that's awesome. Well, you know, before we get started, um, you know, I, I, I started a Lyrical Spit 24-hour hotline, and I told the fans and listeners um, – if they leave a message, it may be played on a show. So I've got mm-hmm. our very first voice message, and it's for you. Are you ready? Awesome, yeah. Okay, here Let's we hear go. It. Maybe maybe you know this person. Here we go. Hey, Dathula the Butcher. This is Easy Calling, uh, the evil zebra. I just wanted to say that I heard you have Malia Hosaka on your show tonight, and you better ask her who her best buddy is. And she better tell you a good story about me. So just wanted to say hi and good luck with the show tonight. Bye-bye. Do you have any good stories? Um, well, he's actually, he is my best, one of my best buddies. Um, if not my best buddy it's in the wrestling industry. That's but awesome. Very, he's very, we're very close on, uh, on a personal level too. Um, he's, he's had my back. Oh God. Since I think since 2000 or 2001. Wow. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, it just, it, he's, he's one of those people that I love to death, but not everybody gets his sense of humor, and he gets pulled <laughs> the fuck off a lot on Facebook. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, he reached out to me. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, so, yeah, so if you don't understand him and you don't know him and you don't get his sense of humor... Yeah, he can be a, a bit abrasive at times, but no, he's he's like one of the biggest supporters of women's wrestling, and he's a huge, huge UConn fan for the women's basketball. That's awesome. Yeah, he reached out to me a couple of days ago, and he said, I, I think he, he said that he runs your fan page or whatnot, and yeah. he said he was going to promote mm-hmm. it, and, and I was like, Grace, he's yeah. like a guy, and I said, why don't you leave a message yeah. and I'll play it? And he's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, he um he d- he definitely does that. He goes on my fan page and posts for me, and helps keep people up to date because I'm really horrible at it. Um, he also helps monitor my my Facebook page so when people decide to be um, jerks on there or, or think they're being cute um, and it's inappropriate, he'll send me a message. And if I can't take care of it, then I'm like, go take care of it, go delete it for me, go you know, go That's in awesome. and and tell them off, go block them, you know. Um, I'm a lot more lenient than him. So when I give him full reign, he will block people that he feels are disrespectful to me. And, uh, you know, and when I go out of the countries and stuff like that, or when I get super busy in between wrestling and my real job, I'm just like, you have full reign of the page. If, if you don't like it, it, it's your choice. It's your, it's your decision, you know? So oh, he's really, he's a great guy to have in the corner. That's awesome. Cause especially in the wrestling business, it's hard to find loyal, good friends. You know, I only have like maybe a fit in one hand that I can really trust and call brothers, you know, right. And sisters. Right. But. Um, I've got, you know, all of mine are basically old timers. Um, and I know they'll hate me for that, but you know, Debbie Combs, I love her to death, but I consider her a friend. Like she's somebody that, I would go to Nashville to see her, to hang out and, and nice. see her outside of the industry and stuff like that. But when it comes to people within the business and within the industry, there's really not a lot out there that I keep to myself. I keep my private life private. Like you, you know, this, if you are on my fan, yeah, well, you said you've been on my Facebook page, but oh, yeah. I don't discuss my private life on there. You know, it's, 
I, I, I don't post pictures of me and my guy. I don't post things about me and my family. It's that is my wrestling page and my private life is my private life. And I just don't want the drama. Plus you got to keep uh, that mystique going too, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, well that, you know, sometimes I have a guy, sometimes I don't have a guy. I'm not one of those that falls in love every other week. Right. Um, (laughs) You know, (laughs) but yeah, I just, I I don't trust many people. Um, Nor Greenwald kindly uh, put the nail in that coffin of me trusting anybody in this business ever again. Wow. And I just don't do it. I know that everybody now is just out for themselves, no matter how good of a friend you can you consider them to be. It you know when it comes down to it, they will stab you in the back in a heartbeat. Yeah. Now, w- when did you break into the business? What year? Nineteen eighty-seven. Okay. That being said, um, I pretty much broke in the business ninety-two, and mm-hmm. and I was towards like. Towards the end, like I mean, I when I started, the territories pretty much was gone, but I, I gone I went, right. Yeah, but my training was old school, and 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 right, you know, and, and wrestling has evolved, and I found myself like and like like the wrestlers, you know, times have changed, but it's like for the longest time, it was hard for me to like. I'm sure you saw that how it seemed mm-hmm. like a lot of the boys like try to take advantage of the other guy a lot and 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 yep and uh, i mean up till like last year i kept this wall up kept this wall up and i was like is it just me or is it like just the old school mentality because like you you know it's just changed i it has changed so much and it's just a dog eat dog world and i i think maybe that that is old school but i mean old school mentality was when you went in the locker room you didn't brag. You didn't pop for your own moves. You yeah. weren't. You weren't talking about everything that you did that was awesome. You know, you went in and you kept your mouth shut. How are you? You had personal conversations. I mean, some of the boys used to sit in the back room and play cribbage until it was time for them to go on. You know, it it wasn't about oh, take pictures here and social media this and social media that yeah. and you know and all. It was it was more family in the back. Like we had each other's backs back then. Um, even though you might not have been able to trust the person sitting next to you because if a spot opened up, they'd step over you to get it. Yep. But at the same time, you knew you could trust them to the extent that they weren't going to go out there and try to purposely hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, let's take it back a notch. What was your first recollection of professional wrestling, whether it was like on TV or at a live event? Um, my first recollection of professional wrestling is sitting down and watching it with my dad. Um, and my dad loved it and it was on every Saturday and it was on at the same time as the Smurfs. And here I am a little girl and <laughs> I want the Smurfs and I am not happy with daddy because daddy's watching wrestling. And, uh, so one day a match between the missing link and Bugsy McGraw came on and Bugsy runs around the ring doing his airplane thing uh-huh. and starts banging his head into the turnbuckle. Well, missing link, imitates him to the point that he knocks himself out and Bugsy gets the pin. (laughs) Now, looking back on it, that match was absolute genius because neither of them did a thing, right? And they had the crowd. Like, their gimmicks were over. They had the crowd. The crowd was entertained. But they didn't do anything. Um, But, you know, 30-something years ago when I'm watching this, I'm like, really, Dad? This is what you like? This is so stupid anybody could do it and he was just like well i bet you couldn't i bet you couldn't get in there and do what these guys do and i'm like really so i set out and started following wrestling and trying to meet wrestlers and trying to figure out how to get trained and i finally um met hacksaw higgins in my hometown and uh that i was living in at that time and um he hooked me up with misty blue and i went up to her school where i was trained by Killer Kowalski, he came down to teach the girls that were there for, for two weeks, and he gave us a oh, crash course in Kowalski knowledge. Wow. I remember yeah. when I met Killer Kowalski was when uh, uh, WWF at the time did their first Monday Night Raw at the Key Arena. So Playboy mm-hmm. Buddy Rose, he got us, you know, all a spot, right. you know, and a uh, we got, I got to, got to take bumps with uh, Killer Kowalski, you know, because they wanted you to 
mm-hmm. bump a certain way and hit the turnbuckle, hit yeah. the ropes a certain way, you know, and I always cherish that. I was like, wow, that's killer Kowalski. Yeah, no, and and the thing is that that's the knowledge because I I had that. Like he taught me to hit the take a bump a certain way. Uh-huh. He taught me how to hit the ropes and the turnbuckles, and that's why I've had the longevity of my career that I've had because he taught me how to do it right, and then my veterans taught me when to do it. So you know, I I didn't go out there and just kill myself and trying everything under the sun. Yeah, I always say less is more. I learned that as I got older. Less is yes. more. Now, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, do you feel what's missing too? Lack of veterans in the dressing rooms, like you know, to pick their brains. Um, I don't know if it's lack of veterans because a lot of your veterans now aren't going. A lot of the advice I think that they would give the new people would think is outdated. Um, because right. everybody wants instant gratification now. You want that that fast move, that that finish. You don't want the drug out storyline. I mean, when you get that drug out storyline, I mean, it, all right, for instance, there's a TV show that I watch, and they're dragging this storyline out, and I'm like, would you please give me something? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that's what wrestling used to be. Yeah. And um, but they keep me coming back because I'm I'm waiting to see where this goes, right? Yep. Um, but, but people don't have the patience for that now. They, they want, you know, the angle to start today and finish up by Wednesday. Um, so the veterans would probably tell them to slow down and teach them how to work and teach them the psychology and, and they want the holy shit chant and the, this is wrestling yep. chant. And they're, they're more worried about popping for their own stuff than they are actually learning. Um, and I don't, and I think the veterans see that. So they, they aren't going to go out of their way to, you know, give out this knowledge they're not going to talk to a wall because there's just no sense in it yeah yeah and it, yeah or or I, I i always see these younger cats too when a veteran goes up to them and they they take offense to it like yeah well, yeah but now, you didn't think that was great Exactly, exactly. Oh, oh this is what yeah. I was going to say. It seems like the the boys, not everyone, I, I'm not saying all the boys. But no, not everybody, them, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them that are not properly trained or whatnot, they, they seem like they're out there, they want to mark out the, bo- the, the the guys in the back and then actually do what's good right. for business. Exactly. They're, like I said, they're more worried about the pops that they get than they are about the art of what they're doing. Um, it's, you know... I. I, I'll never understand it. I yeah. love the art. I love the story. I, you know, um, I was doing those high flying moves before anybody was doing them. Mm-hmm. Um, but my veterans made me settle down. They made me put them in at strategic points so that it was an up, you know, an upswing in the match. It was the baby face making a comeback. It was, you know, but I mean, even the heels now, the heels don't want to be heels. They don't want to piss anybody off. They want, they want the pops just as much. They yeah, want they everybody to cool love heels. them too. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now, being, and then my other favorite thing is uh-huh. I want to be a tough baby face. Tough. The, I'm like, what is that? Right. Right. Like, no one wants to cower out. You can't get hurt. No one wants to be that yeah. little cower, you know, and, and, and yeah, no, I, I feel yeah. you. No, like, you don't, you don't want to sell. You don't want to act like it hurts. Well, I guarantee you that if uh, he put it on right, it would hurt. <laughs> yeah. Now, sitting back during the, the, the stay at home, you know, and just watching wrestling and stuff, what really – I just happened to see this online. I, I, I don't know if you watch AEW. and I, I actually don't watch any wrestling because I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> okay, thank you. You know, I, I kind of watch it out of habit, so I'm watching AEW because of Mike Tyson. Right. I'm Mike Tyson, Mark, right? Right. And mm-hmm. love his podcast and stuff. And so he right. was on and he did a thing with Chris Jericho. And right. it kind of relived the, the Tyson, uh, uh, Tyson and Stone Cold Steve Austin. But what they did in the right. ring, it was great. Uh, and and right. Tyson was on. But what really hurt me was one of the guys in uh, Tyson's, I don't know if it was in his entourage, was in the back room right after the show. Mm-hmm. He tweeted Tyson and Jericho in the inner circle all laughing it up, buddy, buddy. Right. And I'm thinking, it's wonder if Jericho's going to be pissed about it or what, but I'm like, oh, I don't know. It was a big letdown. I was like, uh, yeah, today's day and age is 
everybody thinks that's okay because everybody knows it's a work. It's not, I don't like to say it's not real, but to them, it's not real. Um, right. But to me, it's like learning how the magician did the trick. Like, once you know the secret to it, the illusion's gone. Yes, yes. So how am I supposed to really hate you if I see you laughing and smiling and buddy-buddy with somebody in the back that you yeah. just went out there and supposedly destroyed? Yeah. I, you know, it. I get that. But, like, it, you know, I, it's just so hard for me to understand that. Like, I, I don't take pictures with my opponents. I don't right. take... You know, selfies after the show. I don't, it, it, well, first off, I hit my pictures anyway. But I still don't, <laughs> I, I'm not one of those that is constantly got to have a picture and got to tweet and got to Instagram and, and has to have something out there. Because I don't know, I guess when I want to put something up, I want it to mean something. And if you just post everything, it doesn't mean anything. And if right. you post stuff that basically destroys the angle that you're building, then why are you building the angle? Right. Like, wouldn't it have been better for one of his guys in the entourage to have taken a video of them actually going at it in the back, like a heated argument, mm -hmm. and like something went wrong in the ring, and now there's really legit heat, and, and the two of them just like push off of each other and, and walk yes. away, or or then get broke up, and then go somewhere private where there are no phones, and there are no tweets, and there are no everything, and then have fun and laugh and joke about how they just worked everybody. Well, you know, you know? What, what kind of pissed me off, this asshole, when he did it, it didn't even look mm -hmm. like the guys knew he was doing it because he did it over his shoulder right. kind of slyly. And I was like, oh. right. You know, I don't yeah. Know. So basically, yeah, he was just like he was, you know, and again, I just look at it like the fact that um, you just learned the secret to the magician's trick. So now yeah. the magician's illusion is never going to work. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't. I don't I'm not like, first off, I'm not a super nice person to start with, but. Um, I don't go out and I, and I don't piss the crowd off and I, I don't go out and be the Uber bitch that I am in a ring and then go to the picture table and laugh and smile and joke. Right. When right. you, when, if I go out to the merchandise table, it's, Hey, how you doing? Thanks. You know, I'm very respectable. I appreciate the fans because without them, I would have never had a career. Yeah. But at the same time, are, are you buying a picture? No. Okay. M move along then. You know, and I'm not trying to be rude, but at the same time, I'm not out there to be nice. Like, I was just an uber bitch in the ring, and now if I'm, like, super nice to you, you're like, oh, well, that was all an act. Well, actually, it's really not. Talk to my family. It's not. Um, <laughs> the niceness is okay. Um, <laughs> no, I hear you. Yeah, it's, and it's exhausting. <laughs> no, I hear you. That's just, like, one time people that just don't get it and I won't name the promotion's name. I, I don't work with them no more. Kevin Sullivan doesn't either. Me, me and Kevin go way back from, you yeah. know, and, uh, so he was at the back show. What's that? Kevin and I go back to WCW days. Oh, wow. You guys go way back. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. He's a great guy. I, I got another yes, story I love him. about how I met him and Abdullah, but in Michigan, but anyways, okay. so, um, we're at Battle Royal. I made my appearance, you know, or thing. And what it was, I went in there and I forgot what I did. It was part of the angle, right? And the guy won and, you know, I, I stumped a mud hole in him, right? Kicked the crap out of him, mm -hmm. right? And, right. And and then he, was, he uh, got dragged out to the dressing room, right? Next thing right. you know, he went out and was signing autographs right after that. Yeah, and I flipped, and I and I and I usually don't flip, right? And I was like, "What the hell?" Right? I yeah. made my debut, and I ran out. I grabbed him from the table, and I start chopping the crap out of him, and, right? And start. I was beating him, work beating him, but I was beating him. I was extra stiff, you know what I'm saying? Right. So right, yeah. I wanted to kick his ass, but I didn't want to kill him. So he just right. took it, drug him back, and then Sullivan was sitting there. And I and I told and I told him why I, I, no I, I I was fuming and Sullivan was like what's wrong and I told him what happened then I kind of felt bad because the guy was a nice guy right. right and then Sullivan goes no you did exactly what you're supposed to do and so he goes did yeah. you tell him why so I went and told him and then he tried to get smart with me and I start chopping him again and he's like I'm sorry I'm sorry and then Sullivan had to talk with him too and then. He came up to me and just right. said, he, Solomon goes, yeah, you know, you did the right thing. You know, teach him. Yeah. But 
Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. I went but on yeah, a rant. I went them. on it's, a rant. No, no, it's fine because you know if you don't teach them, then they don't learn. Right. But the problem is he probably doesn't. He probably didn't learn anyway. Because, no, exactly. You know, the, again, again, back in my day, you didn't go stand out where where everybody could see you and right. talk to fans during a match. Okay, you didn't take away from somebody else's performance like that. You didn't go sit at the at the merch table and sign pictures and sell T-shirts while another match was going on. And now I see it happening all the time, and I'm like, really? Are you kidding me? Like, how, how, did they do this to you? Like, were they out here taking away your time in the ring? Because I don't think they were. And right. I'm just amazed by the people that do that. Uh, and then, or well, real quick, another a- just, analogy I use. Elvis just left the building. Elvis never went out in the couch. He kept his mystique going. When he left, he right. left the building, you know? He left. Right. You know? And the, But this is the thing. Like, if I just beat the crap out of you, you should not be at a picture table. So don't. And if you are, you better be out there basically in a hospital bed trying to get sympathy because, you know, you just got the crap beat out of you. Yeah. And another thing, the word I hate right. is fake. Pro wrestling is far from fake. I hate fake, the word though. fake. Yeah, because it's, it's not. We do get hurt. I mean, the moves could do some damage. I mean, it right. might be pre- the, yeah. Right. So that is one thing because I have the exile girls that I, I train, uh-huh. and I show them. I'm like, if you put it here, you can hurt them. Yep. So you put it here, and you don't hurt them. But if they're going to be an asshole, you slide it back to here. Yep. Because these girls are working. They're yes, they're models and actresses that want that want TV time with WOW and some of them do and have developed a, a real love of wrestling um, even though they really don't know the history of it. Others, they are just athletic and they're just enjoying themselves but they're all a great group of girls. But I do know that some girls will come in there from the pro circuit and they'll take advantage of that. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not going to, you know, so I teach my girls how to protect themselves because I'm like, you're not going to have, I'm not going to be out there every match. You know, there's going to come a time when I'm in exile again and you're going to have to take care of yourself. And so I want them to know this is okay. If a girl does this to you, she's being an asshole. She's trying to hurt you. So give it back, you know? And I don't, I don't believe in taking advantage of my opponent. I don't believe in going out there and hurting somebody in the ring. One, it takes away from what the fans paid to see. You pay to see me come out in my day and be a baby face to get sympathy and then to make that comeback and the, and the rah, rah, rah. You didn't come out there to see me fight for my life in a legit fight or the other girl to fight for her life in a legit fight. And it's the same now. Like you won't come to a wrestling show to watch me lose my temper and just destroy somebody out there for no reason other than I lost my temper because they didn't get it. Um, and a promoter didn't pay me to do that. You paid me and you booked me because of the talent that you know that I have. So I'm not going to take away from those two things, which leads me to the whole fact that a lot of times that my blow ups will be in the locker room and mm-hmm. I will go off in a locker room in a heartbeat. If it's, you know, the time's right. Right, right. Um, but there again, you wind up in a locker room situation. You're no longer in the ring. Now you hit the person. They have you thrown in jail. Yeah. Where, oh, you know, yeah. back in the day, it was you, you duked it out and it stayed in the locker room. And once it was done, it was done. You know, you had wrestler court and that was it. Mm-hmm. Now, so when did you actually get the wrestling bug? Was, this at, was it right after your dad said you couldn't yeah. do it? Well, well, I mean, I got the wrestling bug to get in and prove him wrong. Okay. Um, so I went to training in the summer of 1987. I had my first match August 7th of 87. Um, I was Missy Blue's partner um, at the time. They wanted to be Mary Lou Retton was huge. So they had me in like this little gymnast outfit and red, white, and blue and um uh, it was a tag match against uh, Linda Dallas and Mad Dog Debbie. Okay. And then I went back home, and from there, I tried to find schools and places to work. I kind of bounced around until I got the opportunity to work at LPWA, where I met Leilani and Judy, and then they kind of took me under their wing and, and helped me out a lot there. 
and from there kind of progressed to Debbie. Um, so somewhere in that whole transitional period of following my, to just prove my dad wrong, one, I started having fun. Two, I started seeing that there was an actual art to it and I wanted to learn. And, you know, so I, it kind of just grew into my blood from that. I just, it, it's just like one day it was just there. Like, oh yeah, I'm not going to college anymore, parents. Thanks. I'm going to be in entertainment for the next 30 years. <laughs> wow. So w- when did you realize you loved it and it was like, this is what I want to do? Um, I don't, I don't think I really truly appreciated it until probably, I'd say 10 years ago. Um, or even maybe 20 years ago after the Nora and I had the falling out because I really enjoyed working with her. Um, I enjoyed training and working out and learning with her. I truly thought she and I were good friends. Like I, I really thought that on a personal level that we were friends. Um, and I think that when we had our falling out and I realized that, you know, I, I, I love doing what I do, but this sucks. Like the politics suck. Oh yeah. Um, so I got, so I got really bitter for a while. And then in 2012, I was diagnosed with, uh, some medical conditions that the doctor said I should never get in the ring again. Oh wow. And when that happened, it was like, but I love doing it. I mean, I, I love entertaining the fans. I love going out there and trying to piss them off to the fullest extent that I possibly can. <laughs> it's, it, it, you know, I love passing on the knowledge. Like when I work with people that have ne- that have little to no knowledge of wrestling uh-huh. and I start breaking down the basics and I teach them the basics of it. I enjoy that. Like I, I take so many bumps training that the girls, that I work with are amazed. They're, you know, cause they're constantly like, Oh no, I'll be the bump dummy. I like, no, you, I know how to go up. I know how to protect myself. I'm not worried about you dropping me. I, I want you to do it with somebody that knows how to do the move. And then I'll watch and we'll make sure you're doing it right. But the initial start of it, I want to know that you're doing it right. So that I don't want to chance somebody that doesn't know how to take a fall and doesn't know how to protect themselves bumping, um, getting hurt because the girl's learning something. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's just, I, I've got no problem. I'll jump up in a ring and, and work out with, with anybody and, and take bumps and whatever. I just, there's an art there that I just love and I would love for people to, to pass it on and for somebody to actually get it yeah. and say, you know what? This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do, do you have a school right now? I don't. Okay. Um, I, the only time, the only place I work out with girls is at wow. And um, I only work with my girls exile, Oh, okay. um, but I have done, you know, but I do seminars, uh, Rocky mountain for wrestling has brought me into Denver a few times for seminars. Um, you know, and I get out there and, uh, teach what I can. You know, I try to teach the girls some girl specific stuff because guys and girls work different and right. the girls are all being trained by guys now. And so a lot of the girls moves are being lost because they don't know how to do it. Um, I've talked to some other people about seminars and everything, but no, I don't. I'm in Washington most of the time now, and up here it's commissioned. So yeah. I just have no desire to go through all the hoops that you have to jump through to open the school here. Yeah, no. yeah. Well, you know, you said you worked at, in WCW. Did you ever run into Wild Man Beast? I'm sure I did, okay. but as I said, I'm horrible with names. Well, you can't, you uh-huh. can't, you can't forget him. He's like, he's a look like of Abdullah the Butcher, big. Mm-hmm. Huge black guy, nice mm-hmm. guy, right? Like big shout out to him. Love right. you, buddy. Anyways, that's yeah. my boy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, mostly my my time at WCW was limited to uh, I don't know seven or eight nitros, uh-huh. if that many, and then some Saturday TV taping. Um, I, I mostly worked against Medusa when they needed somebody to come in and and nice. kind of put her over and build her up. You know, I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I, you know, that's where I knew Kevin from. He had the book then and, and he was running the show and it was, you know, yeah. I, at least I think he was doing Saturdays or something like that. Um, did you ever get you called? Know, but by, I had to, did you ever get called to New York? Um, 
Terry Taylor got me a developmental deal in New York. Uh-huh. Um, I held on to the contract for a month before I signed it because I didn't want to be exclusive to them or beholden to them um, when they had no idea what they were going to do with me. Gotcha. And so then they called me up and told me that they had a character for me, the characters, and I've got he, um, I guess I'll go into that in a minute. But anyways, the character's name was supposed to be Aphrodisia, and I was supposed to be Anna Poppy Chulo. Oh, they okay. decided that they liked Lita's look better, so they went with her. Oh. But, um, you know, but I mean, it's like people are like, oh, well, you're jealous of Lita or, you know, you, you should have had Lita's spot and you think this. Uh, no, I don't. I don't have Lita's look. Right. I, I would have never. I can't fit that image. And the fact that they saw that and they went with her does not upset me at all because it worked with her. Right, right. I don't think it would have worked with me. Um, and it, so that was completely fine. But the problem is, is now they had nothing for me and now I've signed my contract and, you know, they wanted me to go to Memphis and just wrestle as me. And I'm like, well, I'm already doing that. At the time I was working for Harley Race. I, I held his belt and I was training his students at his school. I mean, I was in the ring five days a week. And I'm like, why would I, why would, who would take a $1,500 a week pay cut to go work for 40, 50 bucks per TV? Right, right, you know, I, right. Like, I'm like, you're not paying me anymore to go there. So please explain this to me, you know. Oh. Um, and I, I guess that's really the reason why I was released is what I was told uh, after a year was because I was difficult. Um, but I, I don't think that's being difficult. I pitched ideas to them. They just. I don't know. Yeah. It is what it is. Do you feel, and I, I you know, do you feel like uh, a lot of these, uh, well, a well, quick story. When I, I moved to the Midwest and I, I was wrestling full time uh, in, uh, you know, in the Midwest area, East Coast, and, and like, you know, Michigan and a few other states around there don't have any commission. So this is like, right before TNA started and all that. And Mm -hmm. everyone was like putting on promotions and they'd hire, they'd have their, uh, you know, buddies to wrestle and they'll Mm -hmm. wrestle for free. So the people that got paid, uh, you know, that wanted to get paid are professionals didn't have a job because, you know, they, everybody's working for free. And then the shows were crap. And the uh, you yep. know they didn't draw. So and then, do you, do and you, then the towns are killed. Yes. So do you feel or do you tell your students that? I mean, of course, you know you pay your dues and stuff. But you know, I, I my motto is I'm not a voluntary well, wrestler. I'm a professional wrestler. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. I'm a professional wrestler. Um, my thing now is that it is not my career, uh-huh. and so um, I don't. I don't necessarily look at it like, I'm not going to go, okay, well, I was on TV and I deserve $500 and I've been right. in this long or whatever. I don't have an exorbitant fee. I just want to not lose money and I want to have fun. Exactly. And that's what I tell promoters when I, when I talk to them. Um, as far as the girls' exile, um, they will probably never work the indies. If they do, I would be completely shocked. But their, their form will probably always be WOW and working for WOW. Okay. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, but when I do the seminars and stuff, I'm like, there comes a point in time. Yeah, you're a big fish in a small pond, but you've got to get out of the pond. If you right. don't, you never get any better. And then you can't get out of the pond. Like, I do tell them because I'm probably going to get heat for this, but I've heard, I won't say I know, right. I've heard that girls fly themselves in for shimmer or drive themselves in for shimmer for car loads. And they pay to do the seminar with Saraya Knight, which you know, that's awesome because Soraya is amazing, uh-huh. but they pay to do this seminar and then they wrestle for free, um, to get looked at, to hopefully be moved to the main shimmer roster. Right, well, if you've done all of this to get there, why am I going to pay to bring you in? Right. Well, like, heard, it, I'm sorry. I, well, I heard that's what killed Japan. All these wrestlers are flying themselves out there. Right. Yeah, and I mean, there was a while back that one of the girls had a uh, GoFundMe page to raise enough money to get herself to England because she was told if she got to England, she could get bookings. <laughs> well, you know, I'm 
I'm sorry. I'm from the school where if England wants me, England flies me in. Yep. If Japan wants me, Japan flies me in. Um, I've worked with promoters that have worked with promoters in those countries to put a tour together. Mm-hmm. But we were brought in. You know, it. Uh, I'm a star. I, I hear you. you I'm you not. Are. You know. You, are. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm not trying. And that's not even like this is before I was ever on TV. Like I was being flown to other places to wrestle um, at a time when women's wrestling was on an all time low. And before and social media, right? Yeah. And before social media, <laughs> but you know, it, it was one of those things that the first time I showed up at shimmer and I had four or five girls in my hotel room. I was like, <laughs> what the hell is this? Like, I don't like sleeping next to my boyfriend, and I know him. Um, <laughs> and I don't know these girls. Um, so I, I like my personal space. Oh, but I hear to you. me, if you don't make yourself be treated as a professional and as talent, then you'll never be treated that way. But these yep. girls, and I shouldn't even say girls, the guys do it too. They're all okay with cramming eight people in a hotel room, you know, because they're going to get looked at and, you know, and they're going to do all, no, no, <laughs> it, I, it, no, <laughs> like, you know, once you start traveling outside of your area, yes, you're going to have to make concessions on, on prices, but you shouldn't be going anywhere at a loss. Not in my opinion. Exactly. You know, if you're willing to come in for free, why am I going to pay you to come in? Right. Right. Well, I'm, and, I'm no promoters lately a good friend of mine he he ran a promotion and he paid everyone you know something he, his yeah. thing was you know you get what you pay for and everyone you know some people might got paid more right. than others but they got paid but as soon as he found out they wrestled for free for someone else he fired them yeah he's like exactly yep yep and if you if you think promoters don't talk they do oh yeah okay I, especially in in the in the areas that you have like 17 promotions running and especially if like five of them are running out of the same building on different nights they talk oh yeah so like you have to set your price this is this is the minimum of what i need and then if i travel this much further this is the minimum of what i need and if i go this much further this is the minimum of what i need and then you make the and that was the thing like i don't get like okay so the one time i toured canada at the very beginning of my career, yes, we paid our way up. But we had a three-month tour up there. And the other girl and I, uh, Penelope Paradise, came out of Florida. Mm-hmm. And we contacted promoters in every state between Florida and Nova Scotia. And we worked our way all the way up the coast. And then we spent three months up there. Nice. And then we came home. Okay. At no point in time did we say, we'll work for free because we're in the area. It was, hey, we're coming through. Can you use us? This is our seat. And if they couldn't pay it, they couldn't pay it. Yeah. But it wasn't, there was no, I'm in the area fee. It was, you know, this is it. This is what I need to get. And now everybody will, uh, will just, I don't know. If, if you don't make them treat you like talent, why are they going to treat you like talent? Exactly. You know, exactly. like WWE doesn't tell the, tell the extras that come in, no, you can't go to catering. You're not talent. They treat everybody else like talent. You may not sit in the locker room next to the top stars, but you have your own locker room. Yeah. And, you know, they don't have you out in the hallway dressing behind a curtain because you're nobody to them. You know? That, right. Yep. Well, I, are you ready to, we got, you know, a handful of emails. Are you ready to? Sure. Okay. Sure. Let's, let's go. We will be right back with emails right after Metalachi, the only heavy metal mariachi band. You can look them up on YouTube and subscribe. This is Metalachi, sweet child of mine. This is a song of love.
This is a journey into territory that frightens even the bravest. A journey to dark, deep places where few men have ever dared to wander. A journey to Uranus. Not the planet. For it is here in the general region of Uranus. Not the planet. That 800,000 Canadian men may be hiding a time bomb known as prostate cancer. And yet, a simple blood test and a rectal exam can shed light on this strange mystery. Get serious. Get going. Get your prostate checked. From the Motorcycle Ride for Dad and Uranus. Not the planet. You've got mail. We are back. Let's dive into some emails. Are you ready? Ready. Let's go. What okay. you got for me? Okay, what we got. All right. Our first email is from Jesus Walker. And he emailed butcherspit at gmail.com. It says, Dayfala, I was disappointed that the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame got postponed this year due to the coronavirus. I enjoyed watching and following you and Chief the World Powers. Dabashi, I think you should be working AEW because your gimmick is great. Thank you for that. And I know the Hall of Fame's been postponed and uh, should check. Everything, CAC, yeah, everything. Yeah, everything, everything. So thank you for that. And, okay, here's the email for you. And it says, uh, Malia Osaka, have you ever got contacted to wrestle for AEW also, what is your most memorable match you had? One last thing. Could you share any wacky road stories? Jesus Walker. Um, well, Jesus, um, no, well, I shouldn't say I, I've never, I will, I have not reached out to AEW to see if they would be interested in booking me. Um, but at the same time, I feel like there's enough people there that know who I am that if I was what they were looking for or I could fit in, that they would reach out and contact me. Um, I never say never um, that I like, I would never say I would never work for them. Um, I have not watched their product. I know they have some talented women up there. I know they have a lot of great people up there. Um, but no, I've not been in any type of contact with them. Um, and I ramble a lot. I do apologize. Um, well, you're doing great. You're making it easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> my most memorable match is actually working for Harley Race. Um, it's the night that he crowned me his WLW Women's Champion. Wow. And I defeated Brandy Alexander. And when I did, I rolled out of the ring and the fans swarmed me. And I couldn't get out of the middle of them. Um, the security came and got me. And then after that, the fans swarmed the ring and would not let Brandy Alexander leave the ring. Um, I, that to me was just, it was a high point of my career because it told us that we told that story, that we sucked them in and that we had them in the palm of our hand. And it was amazing. That's awesome. And a wacky road story. Um, don't know if it's wacky, but it's one of the qualifications that you had in my day to become <laughs> a veteran is riding in a car with Harley race. Nice. So we're in the, Missouri, and we're going from Springfield, Illinois, to Springfield, Missouri. No, Branson City, Missouri. So we're going all the way across the state. And it is snowing. It is a blizzard. And Gordon Sully was in the car. Oh, wow. And um, we're sitting there, and Gordon starts to talk about the girls in the old days and their suits. And Harley looks over at Gordon and goes, Gordon, I know what you're about to say. The wedgie stays. <laughs> so, and then you would hear the crinkle of a can. And when you heard that can crinkle, you had to pop another uh, uh, another drink open for Harley and hand it up to him. Turn, so all he had to do is take it and take a sip. He didn't want to have to turn the can. You uh -huh. had to make sure you had it right. You know, so here we are doing 70 on this interstate and there are snow piles in the ditch. And... Brandy and I are like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but wow. yeah, that was, that was, again, it's another memorable night of, you know, having Gordon in there trying to say that we should tie our suits so that they don't ride up our butts and Harley saying, no, he liked the wedgie. And by the way, I need another beer. Um, <laughs> That's hilarious. Who was driving? Harley was driving. <laughs> nice. Oh, wow. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's now, yeah. have you ever thought about writing a book? You know, I think I've forgotten more than I would remember. Oh, okay. There's just, and 
I really don't have, like, I can pull out some stories every once in a while, but then I hear people talk, and I'm like, I don't think that really happened. I don't remember that. Oh. <laughs> so I may have just blocked a lot of it out, but, yeah, I just, I, I, I've talked about it. I've kicked around the idea. I've even started a couple times just writing down stuff, but at the end of the day, I just sit there and go, I really don't think it'd be interesting. Isn't there a saying that went around something like if five wrestlers said it, it's true or something like that? Um, <laughs> I don't know about that, but I know I just always heard, don't believe anything of what you hear, only half of what you see, and you'll be okay. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, another email from Billy G, and she emailed butcherspit at gmail.com. Kabashi, love your new podcast, Lyrical spit, spit. Keep up the great work. And my question is for Malaya Osaka. If you had the power to change one thing in pro wrestling history that would make wrestling better or today better, what would it be and why? Thank you, Billy. I would erase the knowledge of kayfabe. I would go back and take... Um, that whole tape of where it gets exposed that it's all a work and I would take it away now so that you, what, what, you, what, you I'm sorry, go ahead. Basically I, I would go back to making it where people would argue it's real. Right. You know, now everybody calls it sports entertainment. It would go back to being professional wrestling and you would have to really wonder, is it real or is it not real? I, I would go back to the old school, Heels and faces aren't seen together. They don't talk together. They don't room together. They don't ride together. They don't, you know, nothing. Um, but yeah, but the exposure of kayfabe, I, w- I would erase that. Now, where would you start at? From where Vince McMahon said it, or back when they they had the, you know, the secrets of pro wrestling on network TV? Yep, secrets of pro wrestling. I, I go back and I'd erase all of it. Okay. Then I then I gag McMahon. Everybody, I just. Because if you put that suspense back in there, people would be less apt to want instant gratification because yeah. they believe that these feuds are real, you know? But, you know, um, be, but beyond that, with the evolution of, of everything in the internet, that might not even be possible. So I would have to say the next thing I would ask after that would be the whole damn diva era. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, this is another one for you. It's from Susu. Okay. She emailed butcherspit at okay. gmail.com. She goes, are you currently working on any projects? And if you are, would you mind sharing with us? And what do you mm-hmm. watch? What, what do you watch or do for your entertainment? Thank you, Sue. And then she says, P.S. Oh, I got to read this. It puts me over. Yep. Debashi, That's right, you do. <laughs> Debashi, like I have emailed before, I love that voice of yours and love your new podcast, Lyrical Spit. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Sue. Okay. How could she not love your voice? Aww. I mean, you had a good voice. Well, thank you. you know, I'm blushing yeah. now. Wow, right. that's hard for me. Yeah. That, well, thank um, you. <laughs> so um, really the only project I have working on right now is working with Bambi at uh, – um, my original tag team partner on trying to make wow as great as possible. Um, nice. and you know, and then, uh, there's a new company called kickstart my heart wrestling. I'm to start wrestling for them. Mm-hmm. And then I have a uh, battle broads run by Ian rotten down in, um, Indiana. Oh, wow. And you know, so, so I'm just really, I'm trying just to get as out there as much as possible with as many of the green girls as possible. And, and just share the knowledge that I have while I can. As far as uh, entertainment and what I watch, um, let's see. Uh, I watch a lot of TV, um, but I'm not into the reality drama. I, I can't do all that. I like to be entertained. Um, Big Bang Theory was one of my favorite shows. Oh, I'm yeah. so sad that it's not on the air anymore. Um, outside of that, I like The Rookie, but um, I've been a fan of, uh, Nathan Fillion since he did Firefly back in 2000. Um, so I, I love watching him and I actually met him once and I was too much of a, of a mark to be able to take a picture with him because I was too shy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really wanted to. That's awesome. Um, 
And, uh, you know, my entertainment beyond that is I have motorcycles. Uh, I ride by, uh, both street bikes and dirt bikes and relaxing with my dog. Nice. What kind of dog you got? Part pit bull, part German shepherd. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, she's a big sweetie. Okay. Okay, here's another one. Betty Dune, she emailed butcherspit at gmail.com, and she asked you, what promotion took care of you the best? What advice would you give women who want to become a professional wrestler? Thank you, Betty. Um, a promotion that took care of me on a long-term basis the best was probably WLW, Harley Races Promotion. Um, but of a bigger promotion, like, uh, more nationwide, wow, by far takes better care of me than any of the other promotions out there. Um, short of LPWA, which I was the beginning of my career. Um, wow is definitely on par with them as far as, you know, how they treat their talent as talent. Um, and advice for women wrestlers today or people, women who want to become women wrestlers today. Um, Search your soul for why you want to be in that ring. Do you want to be in there because you want to be the next, um, I don't even know, Charlotte Flair on TV Mm -hmm. or Becky Bayless or one of the twins? Or do you want to be in there in the ring because you actually really love wrestling? Like, so that no matter if you make it up to that level or not, that you want to be in the ring doing it regardless. And then um, my final piece of advice is something I live by. It's, I have to tell my father not to watch it. I don't need to do it. Because at the end of the day, I have to live with what I did. And I just, yeah. that was always my standard. If my dad didn't need to see it, then it was probably something that I didn't need to do. The whole diva era, right? whole diva era (laughs) you know i really got sick of that era too because i got told by so many people and road agents and um workers if i would just go get my tits done i'd be on tv oh man i mean i'm standing in the locker room of wwe or wwf at the time wwe Uh, and uh one of their road agents is like you know if you had your tits done you'd probably be on tv Wow. wow yeah you know and i was like well if vince wants to pay for him i'm happy to get him done but, you know, I'm poor. I was an independent wrestler for 13 years prior to this. Right. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, we so. got one from Brenda Cook, but we kind of already talk about, talked about this, but um, I'm going to go ahead and read it. What okay. Do you, what do you two think about the pull apart between Chris Jericho and Mike Tyson on AEW Dynamite? Someone tweeted a video mm-hmm. of all of them hang, laughing together in the back after it happened. Your thoughts. Thank you for Thank you both for what you do, Brenda. Well, thank you, Brenda. Um, yeah, we did. We touched on that. We already talked about how, you know, both of us were against that. It just kind of, it killed it. It, it killed any illusion of, of an angle, like any illusion that there was heat or a reason to care that they're going to fight each other. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Right, here's one. Right? You're right. Okay. Ms. Osaka and Dabashi, what do you think of wrestling in the United States compared to to like Japan, Mexico, or Puerto Rico, Sarah? Um, well, if you'd asked me 30 years ago, I would have said that American wrestling is much slower paced and we interact with the fans. Mm-hmm. Um, where Japan, they do not. Um, and the Japanese culture, it's very rude to boo, so they just cheer everything. But it's a very, it was, it was a more fast paced wrestling style, uh, similar to what you have today. I've never wrestled in Mexico, um, Puerto Rico. I loved because they were like the old school fans. They still believe it's real. Um, you know, I haven't been down there in, in quite some time, but the last time I was down there, you know, the fire, the fans wanted to riot because the top baby face was beat up and pulled yeah. out on a stretcher. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> while it was scary at the same time, it's amazing to have fans that are like that. You know what I like about Puerto Rico? I was just there last year, and uh, they to me they still believe, and they have the passion, yeah. and you know, it, it, it. I love it there. I never wrestled in Mexico yeah. or Puerto or Japan, but I love Puerto Rico. I mean, yeah, 
It's beautiful there too. Yeah. And the food. I'd love to go back to Puerto Rico. But oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's uh, amazing down there. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. I think here's our last email from Tammy Joe. Do you two being ethnic wrestlers? Wait, do you two being ethnic wrestlers, have you ever witnessed or felt you have been discriminated against in wrestling? If so, and why? Thank you and love both of you. Hugs, Tammy Love. Oh. Um, my ethnic background actually helped me in the beginning because it, the Japanese women were um, the number one wrestlers like they were Japanese women's wrestling was number two in Japan right behind sumo wrestling so you know not everybody could afford to fly in a Japanese wrestler so here I was already in the United States and so uh, you know I had to be from Japan I had to be a geisha I had to have face paint and I had to not speak English and um (laughs) all of this stuff um so but uh, I hate this because with all this racism and or is it uh Floyd, something Floyd, Floyd that was just beat up. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm I'm horrible because I don't watch the news either. Um, but I've never had that level of discrimination. I've never had that level of anger. But I also laugh at the stereotypes and the jokes that are made about stereotypical Asian people, like. You know, and I'll, I'll join right in with them. I'm like, if you piss me off too much, I'll eat your dog. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so as far as like being discriminated against, if I was, I was ignorant to it. Um, but, you know, I, I do know, sadly, that there is still racism and discrimination. And, and I hate that in this day and age that there is. Yeah. Well, uh, are you familiar with Mike Bessler of Pro Wrestling Illustrated? Mm-hmm. Okay, he did a story on me and now my tag team partner, Chief Atacula Kula. But me and him were mm-hmm. feuding across country. And mm-hmm. I would uh, call him a drunken Indian. He'd call me a camel jockey, towel head. And he, he did like a mm-hmm. he did like a, a skit where he went into 7-Eleven looking for me like Crocodile Hunter. But he was hunting me. Right. And mm-hmm. no one... Uh, no one said a thing about it. So there was a black wrestler out of Portland and we were feuding and we, we talked, we talked, we talked about it ahead of time. You know, we're friends and I say, you, anything goes. So I did a, I did a, I, I put up means where it showed a, him pick. He wasn't picking cotton, but he was picking title right. belts like it was cotton. Right. I interviewed a right. monkey and stuff like that. I did that. And, uh, a lot of people got pissed off about it. So Bessler did a story about right. a double standard in wrestling. So we could mm-hmm. talk, we could call each other drunken Indians, camel jockey, no one batted an eye. And, and yeah. And, what year was that? Oh, it was 2000. Oh, it was like early 2000s. No, it was after it was probably about 2000. Uh. About 2013. Okay, so so yeah, it was in the recent past. Then, so yeah. it's not bad. Yeah. I was gonna say it's just a difference in uh, culture and age too. I think because this generation of everybody gets a trophy. You know, everybody's defended yes. by everything. You know, and I'm just not one of those. Like clearly, by my Facebook post, I don't get offended easily. Um, but you know, I I think that we've lost the ability to laugh. Because just because a joke is racial doesn't mean that I'm racist. Right. It's how I treat you. If I treat you as an equal, regardless of your skin color, your sexual preference, your uh, gender, or, or whatever, as long as I treat you with the same respect as I treat, you know, the man, then um, I, I'm not, I don't see where racist is. And going off of that, I'll, I'll tell this little story. Okay. So I'm in Charlotte. I'm a flight attendant for my bill job and I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina on a layover. And I go into this restaurant to pick up some food to go because you know, the lockdown and all I gotta do is take food back to my room. Well, the name of the place was soul food. 
So you can imagine just off of stereotypes, the ethnic background of the owners and the workers in the store. Uh huh. And I get down to the end of the counter and I go to pay for it. And there's this little boy there, I'd say probably eight to 12. And I'm like, oh, hey, are you getting school credit for this? Because I'm thinking, you know, he's out of school. Maybe he gets credit for, you know, being out of school and everything. He's like, no. And I'm like, huh, you just slave labor then, huh? And I was like, oh, crap, that was insensitive. I'm so (laughs) sorry. (laughs) But it never crossed my mind not to say something like that because I didn't look at the color of his skin. Right, right. I just looked at him as a person. Yes. Um, And, you know, but, yeah, it's. We've got to stop focusing and getting offended over everything. Yes. Like, I've had people get offended on my behalf because I was made to be from Japan 30 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> wow. Well, really? It, it got me a job. <laughs> exactly. Well, another reason Bessler did a story on us in PWI is because, well, when I was doing that to Bad Blood, Bad Blood was doing it back to me, and I was laughing, you know? Right. And, and, right. And and I we I even told him before I was going to do it anyways out of respect you know and and right and and I was like more the barrier and I don't know it's a snowflake yeah. snowflake generation or was it the council me gen what do you call it the yeah. count I, council I, I don't I call it everybody got a trophy generation oh, yeah. um, <laughs> well I'm, I mean I don't I go, don't know uh-huh. what what it is that that they feel like we have to be super sensitive to everyone but i'm just saying like if it's an offensive word it's an offensive word it doesn't matter the mouth that it comes out of and you can't have that double standard you know i can't sit here and swear like a sailor and then get offended because somebody else swears like a sailor like oh don't use that language in front of me you know it you don't get to have it both ways well it's pretty funny because i felt I mean, and I don't know if you've known like Moondog Moretti, Ed Moretti. Mm-hmm. I did. Yep. I was. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was actually. Um, that's actually somebody that's on one of my pictures. I was like, oh, I oh really? Remember everybody I took pictures with? Yes. Um, I love him, and I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I was on tour with him. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, him and Buddy Rose. Yeah. I learned a lot from them too. But yep. Oh yeah. I remember after nine eleven, he actually called me, wanted to know how me and my parents mm-hmm. were doing and stuff. Yeah. Well, my, my thing is that, and I saw this on, on Facebook on my, today, it said, uh, America should be relieved that the African Americans only want equality and not revenge. Revenge for what? Nobody in this generation owned a slave. A lot I'm of- sorry. I want equality. I want everyone treated equal. I want, <sighs> no matter the color of your skin, your race, your, whether you're a man, you think you're a woman, you're a woman, you think you're a man. I, I don't care. There is nothing to get revenge on. And I get, I, like I said, I do get that there is racism out there. And I've actually, with, um, with one of the boys, and uh, when I've had some really good conversations with him about, you know, the racism that he's run into. Because for me, to wrap my mind around it without actually seeing it with my own eyes is so hard. Because this is 2020. Yeah. And, I mean, I grew up in a small town where there were racial tension. And I, and I just think that if we can get past that and I can get past that, why is it so hard for everybody else to get past that? Yeah. And beyond that, I don't care that Joe Schmo over there wants to be part of the KKK and he wants to wear his hood and he wants to, to spell hate speech. As long as he, as long as he lets that guy over here that he hates, live his life without causing him harm Yeah. to him or his family or his people. What difference does it make what he said? Well, you know, he's I, entitled to those thoughts. I really think it doesn't make him right. Right. I really think a media has a lot to do with this though, too. The media, it does. The it, social media plays a huge part. The, yeah. the media in general plays an even bigger part in it. Um, you know, and again, believe nothing of what you hear. I don't. That's why I don't mm-hmm. watch the news. Um, because I'm, I'm honest to God, I'm sick of COVID-19. Yeah. I'm sick of everybody needs to wear a face mask. I'm, I'm sick of, you know, we don't, we, you don't care about us if you want to open society back up. 
we need to get the economy going, okay? Yes. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Exactly. Well, I really think I don't want to go into politics, but no. I really no. Think, uh-uh. Well, I just real quick. I think yeah, there's an agenda where they want the Washington State economy go down so they could put a sales uh, Washington State income tax. That's what I think. But yeah, well, you know, and and you are entitled to that thought, yeah. whether yeah. it's right or wrong, right? Right. Exactly. And exactly. again, yeah, I know, again, we're not going to debate it. Nope. I, I honestly know nothing about it because, again, <laughs> I don't get involved in that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, yeah, but it said the nice thing is like, this is America. And be proud to be here and hold hands. Like, lock your arms together against the violence. Don't promote the violence. Because violence beginning violence gets us nowhere yes there are still probably some racist people up there in washington some people from that were raised from the generation before that have those thoughts and things inbred in them but i think 90 percent of this country are good people yes and i really think i feel i you know i have friends are cops and detectives and i i my heart goes out to them because there are good cops out there and this, yeah. this makes it hard for all of them. Everyone looks right, at an officer now, and it's but, like. But it's beyond that. The, so I was talking to a friend, and he's talking about the, the rioting and the looting and mm-hmm. setting things on fire and stuff like that. What did these other people do to you? Right. They aren't the cops. And wh- okay. What did it accomplish? You. What did it accomplish But beyond you taking your anger out on somebody else and now you have threatened their livelihood and their life and their family and you want them to be sympathetic to you and your cause? Yeah. That's not the way to get it. Yeah. Okay? I get that you're mad. I get that you're angry. And I get that you want justice. But that's not the way to get it. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what. If you're standing there peacefully and you were protesting peacefully, and they want to use force, I will be one of the first ones to jump in in front of you because it's not right, okay? But if you go and loot my place of business and now my livelihood is threatened, why do I care what happens to you? Exactly. You're just going to put more hate out there. Yeah. Well, I saw hate this, because hate. I, I saw this meme that was kind of deep. It kind of made me think. It mm-hmm. was Chris Rock, and it said something like a quote. I, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what it said, but it said, uh, "Oh, I don't want to get this wrong." It said something to the effect like, "Racism is still here. It was just never videotaped, or something like that." And I was right. Like, I was like, "Oh, right." <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and I get that because now everybody has a camera phone, yeah. right? Yep. So everybody videotapes well, everything, but here's my thing you were videotaping this while it was happening and you want to condemn the the other cops that may have stood by and allowed it to happen where were you but you know what though okay i'm playing devil's advocate though if those other people did try to interfere what would happen to them would they get they would have been put down too exactly they would have been beat down too but you're telling me that because the cops didn't step in and do what was right, they're just as guilty as the cops that did it. Well, no. Anybody who stood around and watched it happen is guilty to some degree. Right. Because I would have stepped in. Yes, I'm going to be beat down. I might have wound up in the hospital. At least I may you have tried. even wound up dead. But I tried to stop. Yeah. I, I tried to, to right an injustice. Okay? And in the end, I did what was right. Okay, and if you can't start by stepping up and doing what's right yourself, then don't condemn others for being too fearful to do it either. Because you don't know those other cops that were, I don't even know if there were other cops standing around, but I'm saying if there was another cop standing around, you don't know what that person's standing is. You don't know if they're a new hire and they're on probation and they're scared for their job. Yeah. You don't know if, you know, they're aware of what's going on, but are scared of the actual people that are, are doing it. You know, that the cops or anybody else 
whether they were in uniform or not, that could have and would have should have stepped in. Anybody could have been beaten down regardless of their station. Yeah. Simply because it sounds like the cops that did that were just over the top brutal. And they're not going to have regard for anybody, whether they're in uniform or not. So here's my other thing, the, the devil's advocate on that. And I, I work with it every day. I'm like, if you are so bitter at your job that you don't like people and you can't provide the service that you swore to give, leave. Quit. Go find something else to do. Yep. So they were either so power hungry and on a power trip, and that's the only reason why they became cops to start with, because they were like little fleas and they needed to get some power, or they were so disenchanted from everything that they had seen and been through to that point that they should have never been on the job because they were just simply miserable. Now I'm off air. I want to talk to you about yep. another situation about this, but we'll talk okay. off air about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the guy that, that had the knee on the guy's, the back of the neck, I was hearing that he had a, a rap. He was involved in a, I think uh, a few other killings. Well, I don't know. I can't remember if it was killings or not. I do know that um, all of them involved had excessive force complaints in their jackets. Um, the guy that had the knee on the neck that actually did, I guess, caused the death. Uh -huh. um, yeah, he had quite a few excessive force and some questionable, maybe some questionable deaths in actions that he was a part of, but not necessarily, like, I think there was somebody who was killed and he wasn't one of the ones that actually fired the gun, but he was involved in an incident where a gun was fired and the death was oh. questionable. Yeah. I thought I heard something about, there was eight people of color and the only one that wasn't of color that died, they were in a car. So I don't know what happened there. That's mm -hmm. all he said. So Who yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. I haven't, yeah. yeah, I haven't gone into that much depth on it. So, and I don't know, you know, honestly, like I, I'm not an investigative reporter. That's yeah. not my job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, so. I enjoyed your time on here and I, I hope Thank you would you. come back on and do this again. Cause we could talk for hours Absolutely. and hours. Right. <laughs> but now would you like give our great listeners any shout outs, plugs, your social media links, how they could get a hold of you or watch you? Uh, Take it away. Well, my Facebook is Malaya MDM Hosaka. My Instagram is Malaya underscore Hosaka. And my Twitter is uh, at Modern Day Moolah. So you can contact me on any of those. Um, I don't like private messages, but by all means. Uh, you know, reach out to me on any of them on uh, publicly because I'm happy to reply whenever I get time. Um, but my biggest thing is like, if you ever have an issue or a question or whatever, send it in to you know, S lyrical spit, and we'll get back on here and discuss it. That's right. That's right. Well, hey, before we go on a lighter note, how'd you get the name the Modern Day Moolah? I gave it to myself because okay. I am the last of my generation who is actively wrestling. And Mula was one of the last of her generation. She didn't actively wrestle, but she was active in the business. Um, so it really has nothing to do with who Mula was or wasn't and who, all the rumors that circulate around her. Um, it just really, it's more of a, paying homage to the fact that she was one of the last of her generation and I'm one of the last of my generation. Okay. Real, real quick story before we go involving Mula and Mae Young. I was at the mm -hmm. uh, Northwest reunion, uh, rest in peace, Dean Silverstone. And okay. I was sitting there and Moretti Moondog was like, I said, Oh man, Mula, Mula and Mae Young. I got, matter of fact, I'll, I'll tweet you the picture I got. And, uh, uh, or, text it to you i'll look for it but i said oh moolah i said ah she's moolah i'll date her you know i was joking around and i said i right. love her and he's like well you might have to take it up with may young you know because you know they're together right <laughs> yep and i sat there mm -hmm. and looked and i said you know what i'll take them both threesome <laughs> and i walked up there and i said 
I'm in love with you. And I looked at Mae Young. I'm in love with you too. And I got a picture with them and they gave me a kiss on the cheek. I never forgot that. Uh-oh. Yeah. That's but, awesome. Yeah. But, I, I, I mean, I had no problems with Mahula, but I never wrestled her. I never worked. You know, gotcha. I, I didn't come from her school. I didn't have the interactions that some of the girls did. And so I stay out of the rumors um, as far as that goes. It, those stories are for those girls to tell if they want to tell them. Gotcha. But yeah, I just, I just wanted to pay homage to her and the the best way I, I figured I could do it would be the, be the modern day Mula because I'm the last of my generation and she was the last of hers. Awesome. Awesome. So, All right. Well, yeah. I hope you don't get too much cabin fever and uh, thank you. And I'll, like I said, it was an honor and I'll talk to you soon. I will be right back to close out the show. Help us keep this show free for you all. It's easy to do. All you have to do is buy some of our swag at ButcherSpit.com. You can get my official They Full Up, the Butcher Debashi t-shirts and apparel. We also have our podcast apparel, Jibba Jabba, Lyrical Spit, and Conspiracy Talk. From t-shirts, hoodies, and even baby onesies. See, this year the NCAA March Madness College Basketball Tournament may have been canceled. The I Survived March Madness 2020 t-shirts will be on sale for a limited time only. Butcherspit.com. B-U-T-C-H-E-R-S-P-I-T.com. Please spread the word and leave your feedback at lyricalspit at gmail.com or leave a message on the Lyrical Spit 24-hour hotline 360 200 8779. And you know what? You may hear your voice message on the show. You never know. We all need to stop the hate and show some love. There's only one race, and that's the human race. Just be good. It's free to do. And please be safe. I'm going to end this show with Lex Vegas. You can check his interview out on Lyrical Spit Volume 4. And check him out on Reverb. Look him up. Lex Vegas from Cleveland. This is Lex Vegas featuring Naya Marie. Beat it up. Oh, and one last thing. Epstein didn't kill himself. I mean, I mean, it ain't too many people fucking with him. I mean, like, how could you blame me? How could you blame me? I'm fucking with a champ. Champ. Tell me how you want it when I'm deep in the kitty cat. Nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when my face in the kitty cat. Nigga, eat it up. I heard you be in the chair when it comes to three neck kitty cat. Nigga, what? Nigga, beat it up. I said, nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when I'm deep in the kitty cat. Nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when my face in the kitty cat. Nigga, eat it up. I heard you be in the chair when it comes to three neck kitty cat. Nigga, what? Nigga, beat it up. I said, nigga, beat it up. Shorty so seductive with it Nigga fuck that, I'ma hit it Nigga run that, my run that How I done that, but she come back I'm a fun cat with a dumb rap Matter of fact boy, you can better hunt that If I hit that, really hit that That's a kick cat, you would never get back Nigga sit back, sit back, get back Respect this, how a nigga get that Call Naya to rip that That sexy shit, my phone head spit that Shorty like that, when I pipe that Put it down from behind, throw it right back Good night that, put her legs up, knees to her head Nigga what, cause I'm like that Shorty earn that, so she get that Hold a nigga down Shit, he with that Niggas wanna clown shit When they come around shit Yeah, they click clack Put your nigga wig back Met the bed rock Even with the head shots When I'm going down Put the nigga in the headlock And the back shots And the back lock Ham in the back drop Think I'm about to wear lock Tell me how you want it When I'm deep in the kitty cat Nigga, beat it up Tell me how you want it When my face in the kitty cat Nigga, eat it up I heard you be in the chair When it come on the tree Neck kitty cat Nigga, what? Nigga, what? Nigga, beat it up Tell me how you want it when I'm deep in the kitty cat. Nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when my face in the kitty cat. Nigga, eat it up. I heard you be in the chair when you come to treat that kitty cat. Nigga, what? 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 All he gotta do is hit me up on my cellular. Say he tryna beat this kitty up and ain't no saving her. I'm in the shower, give me a hour, I'm on my way. Got that Brazilian picture perfect, ready to take. Ready to take. I love it when he face it Serve it up, let him decorate me 
Give me D stroke, go all in. The boss said, let me see you put your oil in. It's speedy that just a little bit. Hit it with the quick fast. Flip around from the deck, I'm a big guy. Move with it, give a mask till they pass out. Wine, 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 grind. Up to the mouth, keep them out the mouth. Rock out, daddy, that hobby's passing out. It's so amazing. He had me from the first day. He laid me down. Laid me down. Tell me how you want it when I'm deep in the kitty cat. Nigga, pity cat. Tell me how you want it when my face in the kitty cat. Nigga, eat it up. I heard you being a chair when it comes to tree neck kitty cat. Nigga, what? Nigga, what? Nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when I'm deep in the kitty cat. Nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when my face in the kitty cat. Nigga, eat it up. I heard you being a chair when it comes to tree neck kitty cat. Nigga, what? Nigga, what? Shorty put it down and the nigga right of nowhere Pussy wet than a motherfucker And the head gang fire your neck like a motherfucker We connect like a motherfucker Real nigga, real bitch, real shit The attitude that I gotta deal with Shit, all she really want is real dick With her ass up and her face down Shit, it's not a game, we don't play around Going all in, trying to put the balls in Feeling all the laws in, going on the eighth round She tastes like cake And I'ma eat it up, beat it up, grind when the fit is up Been a champ, undefeated, what? Little X, V-stamp on the kitty when I beat it up Got the bottom out, doing everything, thought about tricks Shorty learned shit and brought him out That point no shit, Kiki, Sarah J. Now I'm talking about boss cat. Finna toss that, hit it off that apple and crown. Ask Nanya how I put it down. Yeah. Tell me how you want it when I'm deep in the kitty cat. Nigga, pity cat. Tell me how you want it when my face in the kitty cat. Nigga, eat it up. I heard from being the chair when it come to tree neck kitty cat. Nigga, what? Nigga, what? Nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when I'm deep in the kitty cat. Nigga, beat it up. Tell me how you want it when my face in the kitty cat. Nigga, eat it up. I heard you in the chair when it come to treat that kitty cat. Nigga, what? Nigga, what?